Corinthians, Paul said, so what shall I do? I will sing in English and I will sing in tongues. I will speak in English. He didn't speak English, but the language that he spoke. And I will speak in tongues. And we need to become the creatures God created us to be, spirit beings. You are not a natural person, no matter how much your flesh tries to scream and yell at you that you are flesh. You are not flesh. You are housed in flesh, and one day you're just going to shed it like a snake sheds its skin. One day... You're just going to shed it unless, and I think this is much more predictable, Jesus comes first and we are raptured in our flesh bodies. And for the longest time, now I'm a contemplator and you'll figure this out if you listen to me long enough. You can follow me on YouTube on Salem Family Ministries and uh, you're going to hear me talk like this all the time because I'm always thinking about the things of God. And just recently I got to thinking that when we are raptured, everybody who's gone before us, my daughter, who uh, our daughter that passed away 22 years ago with a brain tumor, uh, she left her body here. My daddy, our daddy, my sister Paulette's with me. Paulette, stand up and let everybody greet you this morning. <laughs> our daddy went to heaven in 1994 or five, five, I think, 1994, and uh, he left his body here. It's in the ground, but he left and went to heaven. But when we get raptured, our spirits don't go. I mean, our spirits do go, but they go housed in flesh. Our whole body goes. That's just something I thought about for years. Well, I'm glad. I'm, that's fine. That's wonderful. Definitely going to be a sign to the world, right, that all of our bodies are gone. But why? Well, I've been contemplating this for about 20 years. So I'm going to give you a two-minute synopsis of the revelation God gave me just recently. First of all, he is in his body. When he raised from the dead, he raised from the dead in his body. And he said, don't touch me. When she wanted to give him a hug, she thought he was the gardener, remember? And she, he didn't, she didn't recognize his face. She didn't recognize his body. But when he said, Mary, she knew his voice. We're living in a season that we must know the voice of the Lord, which is the Holy Spirit. And so many people have so many voices in their head that they can't, the Holy Spirit's not going to shout. I asked the Lord one time a few years ago when I couldn't get direction. I said, I just wish your little still small voice would speak up. And this is what he replied. You don't want me to shout. And I knew immediately if the Lord shouts, flesh shatters. So I was like, okay, don't shout. I will be still. And learn to listen because learning to listen is the only way you can obey. Without obedience, without hearing his voice, how can you obey? And what we don't understand in our culture, because we are such a drive through mentality, is when you put off your obedience, delayed obedience is disobedience. So the longer you put it off, you're that much longer in disobedience because God talks to you for a reason. Now, I'm not talking about when he gives you a vision for something. When the milkman told me I was going to be Miss America at five years old, I wasn't going to be Miss America by six. I was going to be Miss America 17 years later when the 17 is the number for victory. 17 years later, the victory came. And I had to learn how to walk in the calling. It took me 17 years to grow up enough to carry that level of anointing. And now, many, 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 42 years later, you have to grow up to carry different levels of anointing. But as I was contemplating, why do we, the church, get raptured? And it's only one in 14. So basically, you could just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. One of you will go in the rapture, statistically, by the Bible. Revelation 3, verse 10, uh, 7 through 14, but verse 10 is specific. It says, there's only one group of the seven churches that will be kept from the hour of trial that's coming upon the whole earth. So one in seven, and then you take that to Matthew 25, where those 10 virgins were waiting for him. They were all the bride waiting for the bridegroom. And the longer they waited, by the time he finally came, only one in two were ready. So now we go from one seventh to one fourteenth. So one out of every 14, statistically. Now, here's the thing. You're, you're like, well, wow, wait a minute. 
That's not a very big number. That's right. All you got to worry about is that you're the one. <laughs> right? I, I just got to make sure that I'm so in his face that he knows my name, that I've taken on his name, my identity, if my people who are called by my name. I'm not called by my name anymore. I'm called by his name. And when you marry him, you take on his name. And you're not going to marry him when you get there. We're going there for a reception. The reception comes after the wedding. So you marry him here. So if you're dating him, you're already in trouble. If you're engaged, you're still in trouble. You need to take a legal, spiritual contract with the Lord and become one with him here so that when he comes to get you to fulfill the marriage covenant, you will be ready and he will know your name. He will, heaven said, the scripture says that heaven Acts chapter 3, 20, 23, I believe is the verse, says heaven holds him back. He's wanting to come for you. He is not the delay. We, the bride, are not ready. That's why he's not here yet. Heaven says it's holding him back in the scripture. He's like, come on, let me go get the bride. Come on, let me go get the bride. And the father is watching. And the father is watching the bride. Oh, the house is ready. He said, I'll go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you under myself. He's already gone and prepared us a house. He's, he's built it onto Father's house. And we're going to live with the Father in, with Jesus. He's married to us and we'll be married to him. But the bride's not ready. And Father God is watching both the bridegroom and the bride. And the bride's words are not lining up. The last chapter of Revelation tells us and the spirit and the bride say, come. And the very last verse, Jesus and the bride have become so one that the verse doesn't even change. He says, I am coming quickly for the third time in that chapter. I am coming. And without vocal changing, the bride and the bridegroom are so one that he says, I am coming quickly. And she says, even so, come. And when we get to the point where the bride is looking for no one else but the bridegroom, she has eyes for him and him only. Her worship's about him. It's not about whether I'm doing a good job or a bad job. It's not about wh whether I wore the right pants or the right dress or I got on the right makeup. It's all about him and only him. And when I get prepared like that, then I'm looking for him. I had a pastor confront me a few years ago, say, I wish you'd stop saying Jesus is coming. He was a denomination, I won't mention. And he, he had come to our big conference. And so I was surprised he'd come to our conference. Surely he knows who we are, right? <laughs> but he, he got right up in my face and he said, I wish you'd stop saying that Jesus is coming. Jesus is not coming. I said, well, honey, don't worry, he ain't coming for you. Because the Bible says he's coming for those who are looking for him. So you're not looking for him. He's not coming for you, but I'm looking for him. He's coming for me. And I'm going to be ready when he comes. And I'm going to stay ready every day of my life. I've been saying this for 22 years. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Prepare the bride. Prepare the bride. Awaken the church. Awake, oh sleeper. Jesus is coming. We must be ready. And so we'll go up in our flesh because Jesus went to the Father, got his glorified body, came back, hung around for 40 days, y'all, playing with the disciples. And I mean playing because I'm talking, he walked with two of them on the road to Emmaus all afternoon and never let them know who he was. That's the funny thing about a glorified body. It does a little bit of shape shifting. <laughs> the voice never changes, but the appearance can. And you must be careful that you know the voice of the Lord because in the last days, the Antichrist will come and he's going to say he's the Lord and he's going to use the name of Jesus. We must know his voice. He cannot duplicate his voice for his voice is his spirit on the earth. We must be in tune with his voice so we know him. So I said, okay, Lord, you're in your glorified body. Ah, that's why the bride gets taken in her body, and it's glorified on the way up, because why would you, who came to the earth and shed your Godhead body, 
And you came and I, for years I thought he came and shed his Godhead body for 33 years, but he didn't. He shed his Godhead body for eternity so that he could be one with his bride for all eternity. He has a glorified flesh body. We know this because he showed his nail prints to Thomas. He didn't show him some spirit body with nail prints. He showed him his glorified flesh body. And so we will have these flesh bodies. So it dawned on me then, after the rapture seven years later, when the second coming happens and we're all coming back, I'm riding a big horse. How about you? I'm right behind, maybe right beside. Right, I'm going to be real up close front. Riding my horse, coming for that last battle. I'm battle ready right now. You better be getting battle ready right now. You cannot wait till battle happens to start going to boot camp. You got to get ready now for battle. And so I battle ready and I'm coming back with him. And I thought, you know what? My daughter, she's in heaven and she doesn't have a glorified body. My dad, he's in heaven. He doesn't have a glorified body. Your dad, he's in heaven. Doesn't have a glorified body, but he's there. And he's a spirit, and it's who he is. But why are the graves going to open? Never, it just, I just thought that just seemed so bizarre to me. After you shed your body and been there for however long, some people have been there a thousand years, they'll come back and get their body. Why would they come back and get their body? Because you have to have an earth suit to stay here for the next thousand years to rule and reign with him. So your, your daddy, my daddy, our daddy, Gabrielle, they're going to come back through, grab that earth suit, put it back on. God's going to glorify it. And we're going to rule and reign for a thousand years right here with Jesus. Isn't that exciting? I love to know all the details. I like to know so you're not surprised. The devil will lie to you when you're not informed. But if you know and you've got the word, you can dispel every lie with the truth. So don't just be walking through life not knowing what in the world God's doing. He expects you to know. In John, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will bring all things to your remembrance. If you lose your car keys, guess who knows where they are? If you pray in the Holy Ghost, you'll find them. Sometimes he'll put them somewhere just for you to find He's done that for me before. I brought you some gifts. This is a communion CD. Just walks you through prophetically in the spirit worship, how to just walk in communion with him. You want to find somebody that wants that? I just sang again from Enter In. This one has the songs I sang last night and the one I did this morning. This one is called Righteous Revolution, and it is exactly that. It's a prayer warrior's uh, CD. If you like to pray and war, this is Women of the Nation Pray. It's for men too, but... We called it Women of the Nation because I wanted to do W-O-N, we've won. So that's all about prayer and about praying for our nation, the three stages of life, learning how to walk in your authoritative stage of life, speak the word over your family for healing, using the word of God to bring healing over this way, young ladies. And that's the last one because I ran out of my new Holy Spirit book last night. And if you want one, you can go right on our website, SalemFamilyMinistries.org and order it or Amazon if you're an Amazon shopper. It's there too. Open your Bibles. I wanted, I wanted, I came here wanting to preach today on the third baptism of fire. But the Spirit of God has, has really directed me today in a different direction. Uh, not specifically Um, just the details in a different direction. Look at Isaiah chapter 6. In the year of King Uzziah, when he died, Isaiah's talking and he said, I saw a vision. Now, why does he start with this in the year that King Uzziah died? Well, because King Uzziah was his relative and he was the prophet to the nation And so his cousin or uncle was the king, and he was the national prophet, Isaiah was. And he said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw in a vision the Lord sitting on a throne, high and exalted, with the train of his royal robe filling the most holy part of the temple. Above him, seraphim, heavenly beings stood, each one had six wings, 
With two wings, he covered his face. With two wings, he covered his feet. And with two wings, he flew. And one called out to another saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out, and the temple was filling with smoke. Then he said, woe is me. Now, if you study all of Isaiah, you will find out that this is the seventh woe pronounced. Every other woe was some woe of judgment that he, as the national prophet, had woed a judgment on this and woed a judgment on that and woed a judgment. But when it came down to being in the presence of the Lord, he could put no judgment on anyone else other than himself. When you're standing before the Lord himself and you're in the throne room, there is no excuse for anything that you've ever done. There is nothing that's ever happened to you bad enough that will excuse your present choice to disobey God. And as he stood in God's presence, his final seventh woe was upon himself. For he said, woe is me. For I am, the Amplified says, ruined or undone. For I am undone, I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And this particular verse I love in the Passion Translation because he says, I am a a man that speaks incorrectly. I am a man that speaks completely wrong and everybody I know talks just like me. And that's what he's saying here. I am not speaking the way you created me to speak. And everybody I know talks just like me. So it's very hard to correct my speech when everybody talks just like me. And you can get so caught up and you start talking like the world and you start acting like the world and you start repeating what the world says and you start saying, you know, America's going to hell in a handbasket and everything's going wrong. No, no, that's not God's voice. The Holy Spirit is praying the will of heaven to the earth and your interpretation should be prophesying, not the demise, but the rebuilding of, the restoring of, the repairing of. For we are going to be here for a thousand years and rule and reign. Why would you speak evil of the land that you need to be on during those thousand years? Why would you diminish the power of God? I love what these angels, they are not from heaven speaking to the earth. They have brought the throne room down to earth here in Isaiah. Same thing happened in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10. Same vision in a way, same details. The angels had three sets of wings. But in John, Revelation chapter 4, when John was caught up, it said, come up here and I will show you things that are about to take place. God wants you to know what's about to happen. He doesn't want to keep you in the dark. He wants you to know, but you're going to have to come up here to see what's happening in front of you. You cannot stay down low. You cannot live in the world's system. You cannot operate by the world's kind of thinking. You cannot operate in fear and doubt and unbelief and expect for God to show you what's about to happen. You got to step up out of the world's way of thinking. You got to step up out and start speaking how God talks. God talks beautifully. God talks future. God talks restoration. Here, you find out that Isaiah's words changed simply because his focus changed. He started out in the year that my uncle died, and then boom, I was in the presence of the Lord. The moment you get in the presence of the Lord, there's no more looking back. The truth is there's nothing behind you in the presence of the Lord. It's all now and tomorrow. There's no yesterday. Micah says that he takes your sins. He bundles them up. He throws them in the sea of forgetfulness. So why do you keep fishing there? He does not know what you're talking about. So flush it and let it go. Isaiah had to turn loose of his past 
to be able to move into his future. And the first thing God showed him was a vision. And that vision was of what is real on the earth. He showed him the presence of God, the throne room of God in the very midst of who he is. And in the presence of God, the angels were crying out truth. What was the truth? Holy is the Lord. The whole earth is filled with his glory. It didn't say that the heavens are filled with his glory. It didn't say that the first heaven, the second heaven, the third heaven filled with his glory. It said the earth is filled with his glory. It didn't say the earth was filled with his glory. It didn't say the earth is going to be filled with his glory. The scripture says that the angels cried out, the whole earth is filled with his glory. We are in the year 22, 20, 22, 20. 20 began a new decade. 20 is the number for the redeemed. We began a decade, 10 whole years laid apart, set apart for God's redeemed people. Let the redeemed of the Lord say It's all about what you say in these 10 years. Let the redeemed of the Lord say Here it is. We started the year and then the decade of the redeemed. And it was the double redeemed 2020. Redeemed, redeemed. The year of the redeemed walking out redemption. And then we entered into 2021. And 20 still means the decade of redemption. And it overlaps the Jewish decade of 5780. We're now in 5782 in the Jewish calendar. But the 80 in the Jewish uh, way to read, you read right to left. So 80 would actually be the first number you read, 5780. 80. 80 means mouth in Hebrew. It's the 17th letter. It's the pay. And it's 17 means victory. And 80 means mouth. So when God says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, and we begin that year in September of 2019, God says, this is the beginning of the redeemed arising and using their mouth to declare the glory of the Lord. And so we began that. And then seven, five, seven, eight, oh, seven means it is finished and five means grace. So then you say exactly how God is saying these numbers. It is the year of the redeemed's mouth crying out, it is finished with the grace of God coming forth. So when we get to say what God tells us to say, then what God wants to happen on the earth begins to happen on the earth. Why he trusts us, I do not know. We are so untrustworthy as people, but he trusts us anyway. He is so trustworthy and we still have deal issues learning how to trust him when he has never failed us. And we failed him a million times and he still says, I want you to do What a precious father we have who has so much faith in his children who have failed him over and over and over again. And he still turns right back to us and says, you did great. I want you to do. And you're like, wow. He gave me another chance to redeem myself in the decade of the redeemed. Glory to God. You're getting another chance and another chance and another chance and another chance. And today you get another chance to draw another line and step over another line and have no past. And just keep running forward. And Isaiah began to talk to the Lord and he said, woe is me for my lips are undone and everybody I know talks just as crazy as I do. And then he said, I live among a people of unclean lips, but he He prophesies and tells the truth when he says, for my eyes have seen the king. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he'd taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth with it and said, listen carefully, this has touched your lips, your wickedness, your sin, your injustice, your wrongdoing is taken away and your sin atoned for and forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Who will go for us? Then he said, here I am, send me. One touch of the fire of God on your tongue and your words change. 
Why do I want to talk so much to you about the baptism of fire? Because God's people have the worst talk. They talk like the world. They confess like the world. They live like the world. But we need some fire. God's people need some fire so that we can stop being woe is me and become Lord send me. And it takes the fire. What did the angel do? God didn't correct him. God didn't send some kind of mystical thing. He didn't say, let me pour a gallon of oil on your head. He said, I'm going to touch your tongue with my fire and it's going to purify your tongue. And from this day forth, you're going to talk about the future and you're going to stop talking about the past. Malachi 3.11, I started here last night. Just look at the verse. John the Baptist was speaking here in Matthew 3.11. And he was talking about, he said, I baptize you with fire. I baptize you with water. But there's one coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And he will baptize you with fire. And when John the Baptist was talking, he was talking about Jesus. He said, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. Now, this is his cousin. He knows him. I've I've had some theologians say uh, one time that they didn't think John the Baptist, because he went into the wilderness for his training, that he didn't know Jesus. I'm like, are you kidding me? Have you ever been over to Israel? It's like being in the South. Everybody's everybody's cousin. I mean, it's, you, you can't get three degrees away from you and not make a connection, right? And that's the way it was there. But they weren't just far cousins. They were close cousins. So their mamas were so close. When they had deep revelations from heaven, they didn't go tell another soul but each other. Mary ran to Elizabeth when Jesus was in her womb. And John was six months in the womb. And I really believe, Missy, that John had probably never moved at six months. And Jesus walks in just almost past, just barely a thought past God. But he's in the womb of Mary. Can't be seen. Probably not a heartbeat detected yet. But there was life. Because there's life at conception. The life of God hit Mary's womb and the life was living inside of her. And she walked in Elizabeth's house. And when she walked in Elizabeth's house, she just did what we'd say. How's your mom and them? She just did a southern greeting. She might have said, hey. She might have said, hi. She might have said, shalom. I think she said, how's your mom and them? And when she said, how's your mom and them? John began to leap up and down inside of her womb. And the scripture says in Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2 that John was filled with and controlled by the Holy Ghost even in his mother's womb. And I believe that when Jesus walked in the very presence of the room, John knew that Messiah was here and his purpose was completed because Mary could have said no. Mary could have said, no, I don't accept this word. And God would have had to found something somebody else, but he knew Mary would say yes. And so he went to Mary and planted the light of God inside of her womb. And when Jesus went into that little room, John said, I have a purpose. I have a purpose. I have a purpose. I'm going to be the forerunner of Jesus. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. And he began to jump up and down in the womb of his mama because his purpose was completed. From the womb, his purpose was finished. And he began to declare, I believe in the womb, and I believe they grew up together. He was just six months older than Jesus. But there was a point where he realized, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This was John, his bolsterous voice proclaiming Messiah. And when he talked to us in Matthew 3, 11, he said, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me. He's just right behind me. 
and he's going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost. Now, what's he doing? He's prophesying. This didn't happen until Jesus left. He, he lived three more years in his ministry. And then he died, and three more days he was dead, went to hell for us, took back the last two keys, the last two sounds, the last two frequencies. The only two frequencies that Lucifer kept after his fall was the eighth and the ninth sound. That was the sound of death and hell. And he kept those frequencies. He kept those sounds. He began, he was always, when God would call for the sons of God, oh, Lucifer, Lucifer, he would come as Satan and he'd come right in there like he was a son of God because he still had two sounds. He had the sound of death. He had the sound of hell and he accused the brethren. He accused the brethren and he used all those sounds, those two sounds he had left and he accused you with death and he accused you with hell. And every time God called for the sons, here he'd come like a big old peacock thinking he never, he fell and didn't lose all of his pride. He fell and kept it all. And he would march right in there and accuse us. But Jesus, when he went to hell for us, he didn't just pay the price for our sins. He didn't just redeem us. But he said, I've heard enough of you for thousands and thousands of years. Give me your last two sounds. And he took back the frequency. He took back the sound wave of death. And he took back the sound wave of hell. And he said, give them to me. And I just want you to know, read your Bible. He didn't give them to us either. So every time you try to pronounce death on somebody, every time you try to pronounce a judgment on somebody, just know that you're using Satan's keys that God sent Jesus to take them back from him. And you know what happened on the cross? Not only did God redeem you, but he silenced Satan forever. From the cross forward, Satan did not have another sound. Now you might say, how can that be? Every time I turn on the news, I hear Satan talking. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Romans 6, 13. Do not yield your instrument to wickedness. Rather, yield your instrument to righteousness. God made us. The very cell inside of you has a core. And in the very, I used, when we were kids, it was, we'd study science and the core of a cell was a nucleus. But oh, it's so progressed. Then they found the proton and they found the quark and they found all these different things that were deeper than what we knew. But here's what happened in 2000. Scientists began to discover that there was something inside the core and it wasn't a Tootsie Roll. <laughs> they noticed one day under a microscope the very center of a human cell, and it began to move. In fact, it wiggled. It went. And when they finally were able to identify what the wiggle was, it was a sound wave. God spoke you into existence. When he made you, he created an instrument inside of you. You were created to take the place of eternal worship. There's sound inside of you. That's why you can't deny your sound. You may say, I can't sing a lick, but you've got a sound that is amazing to the king. You may be the kettle drum. You may be the snare. You may be the triangle. You may be the cymbal. But that sound that God put inside of you, Satan's been trying to silence you from the day you were born because that sound that you've been given, that frequency, that sound coming out of you brings down a demonic stronghold where you've been planted on the earth. And when you're silent, it stays in place because you thought you had to sound like pastor. You thought you wanted to be first chair violin when you are perfect in the marching band. Exactly the sound God's given you is the one you are supposed to have. But when you're silent or when you yield your voice to say things like, I can't. I won't, I'm going to fail. I might die from this. Yield into wickedness. Satan doesn't have a sound on the earth unless you yield your instrument and let him play you. He is a silent, defeated adversary unless you yield your instrument and let him play you. 
that piano up there, anyone in this room can go up there and play it. And it's always going to sound like a piano. That one there, that one there. They're going to all sound like a piano. But it won't always be good, will it? It'll depend on who's playing it, right? You have a sound that's distinct. It's you. It's who God made you to be. But whoever's playing you determines if it's a good sound or a bad sound. And it's up to you as to who you yield your instrument to, Romans 6, 13. You have full and complete control. Matthew 16, 19, Jesus said, he and Peter had just had this big conversation. They had just been discussing about the revelation of who Jesus is. Look at Matthew 16, 19. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Lord wanted me to bring this to you today. Jesus and Peter were having a discussion, and he said, who do you say that I am? And, Jesus, and Peter said to him, you are the Christ, the Messiah. And Jesus said, upon this rock, not the rock of Peter. Peter was a fallible man. He would never build his church on Peter. Are you kidding me? Peter was a type A, cut people's ears off. You think God would build the church? Now, there are some denominations built on Peter, but that's not the one God built. God said, upon the revelation that I am the Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And, he wasn't finished. Verse 19, and... I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And I've quoted that scripture for years. We find it again, Matthew 18, 18 and 19, several times you find it. But the Lord slowed me down a few years ago when I was writing Tones of the Throne Room. And he showed me the preposition there. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Now, if I asked you all to take out your car keys and you pulled them out, I would ask you, that's the key what? And you'd say, to my car, right? Or your house key might be on there. You'd say, that's the key to my house, right? But the preposition used here, and I looked it up in the Greek, it is of, is of. The only time you use the word keys and the preposition of is when you're going to talk to the worship team and you say, let's do this song in the key of. And there are only seven of them. There's only A, B, C, D, E, F, G. That's the language. Or do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. Each one has meaning. Jesus said, I'm going to give you the keys, the frequencies of these tones. He stripped them off of Lucifer when he fell. And then Lucifer kept eight and nine. And Jesus took them back after the cross. So now Lucifer lost all of his keys, all of his tones. All you have to do is study Ezekiel. Uh, 28 and Isaiah 14 to see exactly what happened to Lucifer. But when he was stripped of his sounds, God gave us a universal language. And it doesn't matter if you're French and Italian, you can both do music at the same time because it's universal. It doesn't matter if you're Chinese and American, you can all do music because it's a universal language. It's based on seven a, an alphabet of seven, God's perfect number. Each one has a meaning. The do, do. That dough has a tone that is a sound in heaven that says unison. And when you get on unison with God's sound, then everything in your life can be built perfect. Because now you sound like God. You don't sound like you anymore. You've been filled with the Holy Ghost. You got a sound of heaven inside of you if you were here last night. Now you don't sound like the earth. You sound like heaven. You're in unison with God. When you pray, you pray the will of God. You don't pray your own thoughts or your own ideas. You're not all half cocked doing all kinds of stupid things. You're praying heaven to the earth because you have been given keys that you're using. Unison. Do. Re. Unity. Number two. Do, unison, re, unity. Me, number three, the bride. Do, unison, re, unity. Me, the bride. Fa, number four, the earth. It's all Hebrew. Do, unison, re, unity. Me, the bride. Four, fa, the earth. Five, soul, grace. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, 
Unity, unison, unity, the bride, the earth, grace. Number six, la, do, re, mi, fa, so, la. Number six, mankind. Unison, unity, the bride, the earth, grace, mankind. Number seven, T, it is finished. Now, I, I could take you all the way up to 24, but I'll just stop with the first circle. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, T. And then, of course, you want to do. Do, that's right, you can't stand it, but you actually finished it, T. And we start again, number eight is new beginnings. Number nine is fruit of the Holy Spirit. Number 10 is law, testimony, and responsibility. Number 11 is uh, rebellion and depravity. Number 12 is divine government. I can take you all the way to 24. But what you don't realize is when you begin to sing in the Spirit, like Paul said, I will sing in the Spirit and I will sing in my native tongue. And when he says that, what we don't realize, we, we sang this last night in worship. I love you, Lord, right? And I live, sing it. My voice, close your eyes and be with him in the throne room. To Never have done this before, but you can sing that beautifully in tongues. Les yoriambake, come on, sing it. what you don't realize is that was singing the perfect will of God to the earth. But you were also praying in a whole nother language that was stripped off of Lucifer and given to you called music as you were singing so do 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 so do re mi mi and you were doing it in tongues too. But what you were actually singing was grace, unison, unison, unison. Grace, unison, and unity for the bride. Unison for the earth to become the bride, to walk in unity, for the bride to be in unison with grace. Mankind and grace. You see, there are so many things that are going on, and just because you don't know about them doesn't mean God can't use you to bring them into fruition. Wow. Every time you yield your instrument, God wants to do something. Father, I thank you right now, every head bowed and every eye closed. As I have thrown them in the deep end, Lord, I ask that, that you throw out some spiritual floaties and we didn't lose anybody this morning, Father. And I ask you, Father, that you move mightily in our hearts and allow us to see how vitally important our sound is, how vitally important you have tuned us and frequenced us. And even if we've gotten out of tune with who you created us to be, I thank you that you give us the Holy Spirit to bring us back into tune. You give us the Holy Spirit to bring us back into unison with you. And I thank you, Lord, for your fire that is beginning to fall 
that third level of baptism, that as we strike the flint, that the oil of the Spirit inside of us and all the reserves of the oil begin to burn in us and we become people on fire, a church on fire, so much so that it's like the founding fathers when the founding fathers got together at the Continental Congress and they began to pray so loudly and so in unison with the Spirit of God that the fire department came because they thought the building was on fire from the Spirit of God coming out of the building. Lord, may that happen again. Revive that depth of prayer inside of each and every one of us, Lord, so that Dothan calls for the fire department to come and put out a fire that they could never touch because it is you and only you own fire within us, Lord. Father, I thank you for your spirit moving in this house and on this precious couple. I thank you for vision and revelation and insight. I thank you, Father, for the move of your spirit to come up out of them like a volcanic eruption of Holy Ghost. I thank you, Father, that this is a new season and a new time and old things have passed away and all things have become new. I thank you, Lord, that we are your bride and we walk like your bride and we talk like your bride and we say even so come Lord Jesus and if that's not your cry I want to ask you right now to examine your heart and ask the spirit of God to show you to put a light on areas where you've been selfish areas that you need to repent Repent means to burn the house to the ground as if it never existed. That's why God says repent. Burn your past to the ground as if it never existed. If there's anyone in this house that would say today, I've known about God all my life. I thought I knew him, but I realize right now I'm not sure that I am his bride and I'm not sure that I am ready and I want to be ready when he comes. I want to be looking for him. I want to be the one that he's coming for. If that's you, just lift up your hand. I'm going to pray for you very quickly as we close this morning. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anyone else? I, I just want to make sure I'm ready. I want to make sure that I am on fire for him, that he can find me from outer space. I am so bright on the earth. Thank you, Father. I see another hand. I, another hand. Anyone else? Just quickly. I see that hand, sir. Anyone else? Just hold your hand up right in the air right now. I'm going to pray over you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you ignite inside of their spirit, man, just the life of God to come forth out of them right now as they've acknowledged their hunger for you, Father. They've acknowledged their hunger to know you and more importantly, that you know them, that you know us, Lord. This is what we want. We don't want to be like those that said, Lord, 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 we've done these things in your name. We've cast out devils in your name. We've done all these wonderful things. But he said, I don't know you. You used my name all your life, but I don't know you. God is not asking for you to be religious. He's asking for a deep covenant relationship with you personally, as if you are the only person in the universe. He wants to know you. And as you abandon self, I want you to pray after me right now, Father. Everybody in the house, go ahead and help them. Pray, Father, my life is yours. It is mine to give, and I give it to you. I do the divine exchange. I take all your righteousness, and I give you all my filthiness. And I turn from a woe is me. I turn from it to a Lord send me. Jesus, I confess with my mouth I believe in my heart that you are my Lord. You are my Savior. You are my soon coming King. I am yours and you are mine. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I receive Holy Spirit in my life. And I thank you, Lord, that you fill this house 
this temple called a body with the sound of heaven. And out of my belly will flow rivers of living water. And everywhere I go and everything I say from this moment forth will be the sound of heaven. I will speak light in the darkness. I will be a light for you. I will be your sound, your frequency, your glory is housed in my body because Shekinah lives in me. Set me on fire, Lord. Set me on fire. I receive the baptism of your fire. Purify me. Purify me. Tell him. Purify me. Tell him. Purify me. Tell him. Purify me. Ask him. Purify me. Set me on fire. Purify me. Purify me. The fire of your presence come. Purify me. Purify me. Purify me right now. I'll be a walking, talking, fire starter, fire walker, fire talker from this day forth. Thank you, Lord, you use me to start the fire of your spirit everywhere I go. For the rest of my life, I'm on fire with life. I am not dying. I am living. Every day that I live, I will live and not die. I will live and not die. And I'll be filled with the power. For you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be the power walkers every day of your life from this day forth in the mighty name of Jesus.